What's up guys, Stan here, and I guess you can call me the Strange House Ghost Girl because like that spooky apparition, I've pretty much all but disappeared for the last two years. For that, and for the lack of communication, I'm sorry. But with a new Pokemon adventure just around the corner, I figured now would be a great time to take a look back at the end of what is, without a doubt, the most controversial generation in Pokemon history. And so, sorry guys, just one sec. Hey, what's up? You're kidding. 400? No, I, I understand, just, wow. Okay, so the second most controversial generation in Pokemon history. But before you take a stroll through the Galar region, let's look back at a simpler time, as I finally review Pokemon Black and White 2. Despite selling around 2 million less units than Diamond and Pearl, Pokemon Black and White were still considered a roaring success by industry standards, and it wasn't long after their release that fans of the series started predicting what would come next. At this point, the Nintendo 3DS was clearly the future of handheld hardware, and with its increased power, it seemed like a no-brainer that the core Pokemon series would finally make the leap into the third dimension. Of course, as we all know now, we'd have to wait a few more years for that to happen, and to the shock of many, the eventual games we did get weren't even the often rumored Pokemon Grey. No, instead of any of that, what we got were two new direct sequels with two never-before-seen Pokemon on the covers. Were they new forms of Kyurem? Some sort of Digimon-style fusion of the region's legendary dragons? Well, after launching the new games with a gorgeous animated trailer in North America on October 7th, 2012, it was time to find out. And I can proudly say that for the first time ever, I was there to buy a brand new Pokemon game at launch. As I talked about at length in the Black and White review, Unova is where I reignited my passion for Pokemon as a whole and being able to catch up with all of the characters from that story two years later, instead of retreading old ground in a director's cut version, had me ecstatic. It reminded me of going back to Kanto in my copy of Pokemon Silver all of those years ago. Unfortunately at the time, the Best Buy I went to only had copies of Black 2 for some bizarre reason, and so some things didn't exactly flow the way Game Freak had intended, at least in my personal experience. But that was okay. Because despite a few minor playthrough discrepancies here and there, I was back in one of my favorite regions with an all new quest to take part in. So were these games worthy sequels to their most ambitious predecessors? Or did they drop the ball and poison the well like a scolipede with a toxic plate? Well, turn on your memory link and don't forget your subway pass as we cannonball into another massive adventure. This time around, we start our journey in the brand new Aspersia City, where almost immediately we meet our rival to be Hugh, and together meet up with Bianca to receive our first Pokemon. The choice of starters may be the same as before, but we soon learn that it's been two years since we last met Bianca, and it appears she's become Professor Juniper's right-hand woman. We then, along with Hugh, receive our Unova Pokedex, as we learn that he's on some sort of a quest and needs strong Pokemon to help him. After a quick battle, it's then time to say goodbye to our mom and head out on a quest of our own. Personally, I think this is a solid beginning. We meet some of the key players, catch up with an old friend who helps sell the two-year time jump, and most importantly, our main characters' names are decidedly more North American than their European-sounding counterparts from the last games, officially going by Nate and Rosa respectively this time around. I also like that when you leave your cozy city, you start effective immediately on Route 19, which takes over from the final few routes of Black and White, making these games feel like proper sequels right out the gate. And within moments of traversing this brand new area, we're greeted by the region's former champion, Alder. He introduces himself with another magnificent cliff dive and proceeds to walk us through Flossacy Town in order to find a rival at a local ranch. After a short battle, the owners reveal that one of their Pokemon is lost. And for some strange reason, Hugh grossly overreacts to this news and rushes off as we're left to find the missing Herdier. And it's here I feel the need to point out another of the big changes made to these sequels, as it's at this ranch where you'll really begin to notice that Unova is no longer off limits to international Pokemon. It's never made entirely clear as to how or why over 200 new Pokemon have popped up in such a short amount of time, but now they're everywhere and they can really have an impact on your team. After playing hide and seek with Hugh, you'll eventually stumble upon both Herdier and a strange man in a pirate hat. Once confronted, he'll reveal that after two years of hiding, Team Plasma is back to strike fear into the hearts of Unova once more. He runs away, leaving Herdier to reunite with its owner as we head to Alders for a tutorial and then head back to Aspersia City to claim the first hometown gym badge in Pokemon history. And wouldn't you know it, the keeper of this badge just happens to be our old pal Sharon, who in Lenora's stead is now a normal type gym leader hungry for his first battle. 
And after kicking his butt for old time's sake, we're awarded the basic badge, which, like, I don't want to reuse the same old jokes, but come on, it just fits too perfectly here. We then have a mini reunion of sorts, get all of our gear set up, and head towards our second gym in Verbank City. Once there, we're thrown smack dab into a father-daughter dispute, which eventually takes us to Roxy's poison-themed gym to grab the all-new Toxic Badge, as well as to one of Unova's most glamorous attractions, Pokestar Studios. It's here we discover Bryson, the former gym leader of Icarus City, has left his position to become a bona fide superstar. And after making a short film together, you'll find Roxy, Hugh, and a few Team Plasma grunts loitering around the Verbank port. After they're swiftly beaten, Roxy has a reconciliation with her father, who just happens to be a ship captain, which is convenient, as along with Hugh, we've got to revisit familiar territory across the sea in order to decode the mystery behind Plasma's sudden return. Castelia City is somehow even bigger than before, and with Iris showing up to help us track down the grunts from earlier, we eventually find ourselves in the city's new sewer system. Which of course, is where most casual Pokemon fans would surely put Garbodor and Vanellish if they had the chance. All jokes aside though, it's in Castelia's underground that Team Plasma escape once again, and immediately afterwards we're challenged to battle Berg in his gym above. And it's also here that we bump into a strange man wearing a lab coat and glasses, who's impressed with our skills. He leaves as quickly as he arrives, and with things settled down for now, it's time to break out the raid, because you'll have to squash some bugs if you want Berg's coveted insect badge. Also, it's worth mentioning that despite this technically being the second time we've battled him, his whole gym has been reimagined, with new trainers to compete against and puzzles to explore, which is frankly an outstanding touch on the part of Game Freak. Sure, the man has a nearly identical team as before, but it's this sort of freshness that helps alleviate the sense of familiarity Black and White 2 are bound to have given how they were made, and it keeps the pace moving, even for the most seasoned veteran of this expansive region. Now that we have our third badge, it's time to head north towards the desert. But before we can pass through, we're formally introduced to Colrus, the man in the glasses from earlier whose ambition is to bring out the power of Pokemon. He puts our abilities to the test with a short battle, and then leaves us to explore Nimbasa City, where we find the most stylish gym in Unova devoid of its famous leader. It seems like most trendsetters, Elisa got bored of her old routine, and opted to start a new runway-themed gym down the street for both aspiring trainers and models alike. But after a glamorous battle, she'll concede the Bolt Badge as we move on to Driftvale City. It's here that we learn about the Reborn Team Plasma, and how two years ago after Getsus' defeat, one side pledged allegiance to N, while the others formed the new, more nautical group who've been causing trouble. We also learn during a conversation with the former sage Rude, that many years ago, Hugh's younger sister had her purloin stolen by Team Plasma. Unfortunately, back then he failed to stop the Pokenapping, and has since dedicated his life to getting tougher in order to get it back. Overall, Driftvale has a lot to discover, both in terms of story and gameplay. However, before we can focus on the latter, we must first overpower Clay and his ground-type team in order to add the Quake Badge to our growing collection. Afterwards, he takes us to the city's newest edition, the Pokemon World Tournament. You'll have to wait a bit longer to hear my full thoughts on this competition of champions, but in terms of the story, we have a mandatory battle against our rival, Sharon, as well as Colres, to give us a sense of what the venue offers, and of course, to show us how much stronger the enigmatic scientist has become. Once he's beaten, our celebration outside is cut short by a panicked Team Plasma Grunt, who leads our gang to a strange pirate ship. It seems the organization is docked in Driftvale, and after taking on Grunt after Grunt, we're greeted by Rude's old cohort, Zinzolin, who uses the Shadow Triad to remove us from their seaside base as Plasma departs. We then have a quick encounter with the legendary Pokemon Cobalion, before heading to Chargestone Cave, where we can hear a faint voice off in the distance, who wishes to protect their friend. We sadly never catch up to the mysterious figure, but after reaching the end of the Sparkling Cavern, we arrive back in Mistralton City, where we finally come face to face with Professor Juniper and are able to challenge Skyla at her high-flying gym. And once her engine sputters, she'll hand over the Jet Badge, bringing our total to six. Now at this point, you might be thinking that aside from the reformed Team Plasma, things are playing out an awful lot like the original games, and you would be correct. However, almost as though the developers sense some deja vu themselves, it's here the plot shifts quite a bit, as rather than head east as per black and white, we instead hop in Skyla's airplane and take a flight to the all-new Lentimus town. To be fair, there's not a ton to do here, barring one important side quest I'll gush about later, but it refreshes the narrative just enough to keep veterans on their toes, and makes for some cool sightseeing as we continue onward through Reverse Mountain. Eventually, we'll end up in Undella Town. Yes, that same seaside village with Cynthia from Black and White's postgame, except now we're headed in the opposite direction towards Lucanosa, with an optional battle against Cobalion along the way. 
It's at this point we get our first insight into the third legendary dragon Pokemon found in Unova. According to a popular regional myth, a long time ago, a meteorite fell from the sky and forged the giant chasm north of Lucanosa. Unfortunately for the townspeople, it turned out that an ancient Pokemon was hidden inside the space rock, and it's been said that when darkness falls over the land, it will appear as it freezes everything around it and consumes both people and other Pokemon. And it's because of this legend that high walls were built around the village in order to keep the frigid menace away. Wait a minute, does that mean that this legendary Pokemon is a... So yeah, it seems the most northern part of this region is home to some pretty amazing stories. And after a tense run-in with Zinzolin, we're led straight to another mythological hotbed, Opelucid City. Immediately upon entering, we're greeted by our old pal Iris, who reveals that the local gym leader just happens to be her adopted grandfather, Drayden. And once she leaves, we're free to take on the elderly Dragon Master, who has a breathtaking new gym and a seventh badge to collect. Of course, in this adventure, there's still one more powerful gym leader to go. But before we can get there, Drayden fills us in on the origins of Reshiram and Zekrom. It's in this lesson that he reveals that the two legendary Pokemon were once one singular entity, and when they eventually split, their absence resulted in a third dragon named Kirin. The wise gym leader believes that due to a special item called the DNA Splicers, which have been passed down to him through generations, Kirin must still exist somewhere in Unova. And as if it were fate, immediately after he finishes his tail, Team Plasma shows up in a monstrous airship and manages to cover the entire city in ice. It seems they're after the DNA Splicers, and just as Drayden's about to give them to us for safekeeping, the Shadow Triads swipe them and escape. Luckily for us, Sharon is still a bit of a nerd, and after some digging, he believes that Team Plasma have retreated towards Himalau City, as there's been a strange spike in sub-zero temperatures in the traditionally tropical area. And so, after passing through the gorgeous underground marine tube, we arrive in Unova's most tropical city yet to battle Marlin for the Wave Badge. Now that we've gotten all eight badges, it's time to disband Team Plasma once and for all. And after making our way through Seaside Cave, we board the Plasma Frigate once again to discover that the special weapon they've been using to freeze Unova has actually been powered by the legendary Pokemon Kirim this entire time. With this massive reveal, Zinzolin challenges us to yet another double battle, and like before, once his team is sunk, the Shadow Triad appear and kick us overboard so that his evil organization can escape towards the giant chasm. When we arrive at their new base of operations, we find a standoff between the old and new incarnations of Team Plasma. With Rude's help, we're able to attack the warship once more with all of our power, and after some puzzles and yet another battle with Zinzolin, we finally come face to face with the leader behind the attacks, the mysterious researcher Colrus. True to his words, Colrus wants to bring out the full potential of Pokemon, and figures that Team Plasma's merciless approach to world domination might be the best way to achieve this. Of course, at this point, his Steel-type team is no match for the power of an advanced trainer and the bonds we share with their Pokémon. And Colrus concedes that perhaps love and friendship are the key to unlocking the power he seeks, after all. Although in a refreshing twist, he doesn't come to this realization because it's morally superior, but because through our battle, he believes it to be the most optimal approach to his work. Yeah, Colrus is as cold as the chasm itself, and in my opinion, he's elevated as a bad guy because of it. Oh, and speaking of cold, we've still got an enormous ice dragon to save. But before we can free the beast, we run into the secret mastermind behind Team Plasma's resurgence as we come face to face with Black and White's true antagonist, Getsis. The missing cult leader is done with illusions and persuasion, and this time his plan is simple. He wants to rule Unova with an iron fist, and will use Kirim's overwhelming power to freeze anything or anyone who stands in his way. Before we can question his motives any further, the Shadow Triad show up once more, but this time they're prepared to battle in order to stall for time. It's also revealed here that one of the Triad's members is now master to Hugh's sister's Purloin, which is evolved under the Vile Trainer's command. After taking on all three members, the group gives up the stolen creature with barely a second thought, as Getsis has moved Kirim into the heart of the giant chasm, where he can put his wicked plans into motion. Once we arrive to confront him, he brings out Kirim in order to freeze the entire region whole, but before he does, he sends a powerful attack towards us. And just as all hope seems lost, an old friend makes his grand entrance. It turns out our old pal N has been on the hunt to bring his adopted father to justice since the events of the last games. And when he saw the disaster in Opelucid, he came as fast as he could to save Kirim and all of his Pokemon friends from the Sage's wickedness. Unfortunately, before he can do much of anything, Getsis utilizes the power of the DNA Splicers. And with a blast from Kirim, N's partner Pokemon is forced back inside the ancient stone it emerged from during the events two years ago. And from there, things only get worse. 
Using the splicers and a technique called Absofusion, the two legendary dragons combine their DNA to become either white or black Kirim, depending on which Pokemon it fuses with. Yes, as revealed by the game's packaging, Pokemon has now done what everything from Digimon to Transformers to thousands of DeviantArt accounts have done time and time again, and given us our first canonical Pokemon fusion. Now, you'd think this hybrid monster utilizing the power of two incredible legendary dragons would be challenging, but because of the fact that you can't catch it, you're free to let your entire team unload their strongest attacks on the suffering beast in order to destabilize it. Afterwards, an enraged Getsis, now without Kirim at his command, pledges to once again destroy a teenager for getting in his way. And after one of the most challenging battles the game has to offer, which for the record still features the same BS underleveled Hydrogen, Getsis finally snaps and has to be taken away by the Shadow Triad. N, though emotional, thanks us for stopping his narcissistic guardian, and states that Kirim taught him that Unova's warring truths and ideals will eventually come together, and that Pokemon and humans will be free from the oppression of Pokeballs. He then challenges us to put our own ideals to the test by taking on the Pokemon League before flying off with his best friend at his side. And speaking of best friends, our old pal Hugh shows up to let us know that his sister's Leopard, though still struggling, will be okay once it's back to 100%. He then echoes N's sentiments regarding us challenging the League, and with that it's time to revisit Victory Road once more. Despite being located in the exact same spot as before, Victory Road has undergone some massive changes since N's castle rose up from the League's headquarters during the events of Black and White. However, when it comes to the Elite Four, there's surprisingly little that's changed over the past two years. You're still able to challenge whichever member in whichever order you'd prefer, but Marshall, Grimsley, Caitlyn, and Chantal have the exact same teams of four Pokemon they've always had, at least during your first campaign. And when all four have been defeated, it's time to take down the League's champion, who up until this point is still shrouded in mystery. Will it be N, a former gym leader, or perhaps even our very own character from two years ago? Well, once we've made it to the summit, it's revealed that it's in fact Iris who has succeeded Alder as Unova's reigning champ. She's eager to prove her abilities in battle, and with a more varied team around her, as well as a fancy new dress, she's a tougher fight than you might be expecting. But if you've made it this far, you should have no trouble defeating the former Opelousa gym leader, and once beaten, she'll confer the title of Pokemon League Champion to you and your tired team. And once our data is recorded in the Hall of Fame, and we receive a strange key for our troubles, we're able to take in the game's credits, as they show us our travels back home, where our mom is waiting. And that, my friends, is the major plot of Pokemon Black and White 2. Now, as usual, there's a few things I skipped over, and of course some crucial post-game content I'll be talking more about during the next few sections of this review. But overall, that's the gist of how our second Unova adventure shakes out, and you know what? It's pretty remarkable. To me, story-wise, it doesn't hit home quite as much as the originals, but that's okay, because it doesn't have to. Black and White laid the groundwork for these titles, and despite having every opportunity to phone it in, the fine folks at Game Freak went above and beyond once more, and brought some much needed closure to their most ambitious experiment in the process. It's not always perfect, and there's a few instances where both the plot and the gameplay get a little too similar, but I think they're fantastic follow-ups from a narrative perspective. If our community had have been given the much prophesized grey version instead of these two direct sequels, it would have been exactly what we were expecting. The best parts of Pokemon Black and White, with a little added content and a slightly altered storyline to combine both games into one definitive Gen 5 experience. And that would have been great, just like Platinum and Emerald before it. But by allowing players to further explore Unova and go on one last adventure filled with surprises and even more exceptional character development, it's hard to find any meaningful flaws in Pokemon's first direct sequel. And together with their predecessors, these games form the most compelling and operatic story the series has ever told. Seeing how the actions and consequences in one have lasting effects and impacts on the other isn't just impressive for a Pokemon game. It's impressive for any story, in any genre, plain and simple. Normally I like to end the story segment with a pretty neutral take so that I can dive into the how and why during the next few sections. But as these games proved, sometimes the best things can come out of breaking tradition. And so I want to be as clear and opinionated as possible when I say that the ongoing storyline found in this game might be the best of the series. Now, this is of course a pretty bold statement, but please allow me to dive a little deeper and give evidence as to why I feel this strongly about these sequels, as we take a look at the best new and returning features that Black and White 2 have to offer.
Once again, there's a lot to unpack here story-wise. But if their predecessors were focused on conflict, I think it's safe to say that Black and White 2's central messaging is all about compromise and finding balance. Of course, the box art alone sort of makes this obvious, but aside from Kirim becoming whole again, there's examples of this everywhere. For starters, we have narrative examples such as Roxy's ship captain father, who discovers a passion for acting, but ultimately decides to go back to his day job. Or even Alder, who conflicted over everything that happened leading up to and during the events of the last games, has given up his title as champion and retired. And at first, these practical decisions might seem born out of fear or weakness. But in the case of these characters, they actually come from finding peace. Alder had a tough time coming to grips with the loss of his partner Pokemon, and by the end of Black and White seemed conflicted about his place in the world. And Roxy's dad is a successful ferry operator whose dream of being a movie star is a source of contention with his daughter and chosen career. But by the end of their respective journeys, they recognize what brings them joy in life and commit to being more balanced in their approach to their work. In fact, in the case of Roxy's father, it turns out that he began pursuing his wildest dreams because he admired his daughter's ability to balance her roles as a gym leader and a rock star and needed to prove something to himself. Neither one of these characters gives up on their goals or ambitions, but rather they discover a more harmonious way to realize them while taking the needs of both their loved ones and own abilities into account in a more positive and mature way. The games also go out of their way to present Getsis, Colress, and the failed members of Team Plasma as individuals who can't find it within themselves to compromise. And to me at least, this is shown as a key reason as to why their ambition cannot succeed. Whether it's because they feel cheated or unrecognized, or because they're so committed to progress that they refuse to accept the truths and ideals of others, their arrogance and stubbornness eventually leave them broken and defeated. However, I think my personal favorite example of the game portraying these themes is in one of its most simple. Throughout the original titles, every time we venture through Castelia City, we're met with movement and noise. There's shops and buildings everywhere, people moving a mile a minute, yelling at us to get out of the way, and although it certainly succeeded at being Pokemon's bustling parallel to New York City, I think it's fair to say that at times it can feel a bit overwhelming. But in these games, after you've cleared Team Plasma from the sewers, you can access an unforeseen hideaway in the middle of the city. I know it might sound silly, but to me it's this one hidden square of solitude that perfectly encapsulates the balance between new and old, future and past, and conflict and serenity. It feels special and perfectly balances the hectic metropolis in a way that only Game Freak could manage, and anytime I play through Black and White 2, it reminds me to just take a moment and relax. Of course, with all of the additional content stuffed inside the cartridge, it can be hard to stop and take in all of the game's offerings. Although, aside from a few new beautifully rendered cutscenes and models, don't expect too much of an upgrade here. Although that's not necessarily a bad thing. It would have been extremely difficult for these titles to squeeze any more out of the primitive DS hardware at this point, and as someone who adores the look and landscapes from this generation of Pokemon, more of a good thing is fine by me. Especially since there's so many new Pokemon from older generations to capture, that you're going to feel like there's more to see and discover anyways, even if it's a bit of a cheat. Remember, Pokemon outside Unova weren't available until the post-game of Black and White, and even then there's a pretty high chance that you wouldn't have seen something like Mareep or Riolu brought to life in this new style unless you imported them from past games. So in this way, what's old starts to feel new again, and allowing players to use hundreds of non-regional Pokemon throughout their journey isn't just a blast of nostalgic fun, it also widens the variety and party options during the actual campaign, all while being another instance of balance and compromise. And this level of connection to previous generations is only expanded as our story continues throughout the postgame. You still got Cynthia in her cottage, and of course you'll receive the national decks and access to a variety of past Pokemon species, but along with all this and a fun cameo from Crasher Wake, you can also battle in specialty tournaments at the Pokemon World Tournament in Driftvale City. This optional tournament series is quite possibly the coolest and most fondly remembered addition to these entire games, and honestly, just from a nostalgic position alone, I'm inclined to agree. Although maybe not as ambitious in its variety as past facilities like the Battle Tower or Frontier, it more than makes up for it in sheer fan service, as you can participate in specialized tournaments that feature past gym leaders and champions from every single previous region. We're talking Kanto through Unova, Brock to Bryson, Heck, even both Tate and Eliza from Gen 3 show up in the Celebrity Royal Rumble. And overall, the PWT is just a much better and more rewarding successor to the Battle Subway in black and white in pretty much every way. 
The participants are familiar rather than two random guys, you can still earn battle points to exchange for helpful items, and most importantly, the variety has been enhanced tremendously, as you can now battle in single, double, triple, or rotation battles if that's what your heart desires. It's as though some crazy time traveler from Game Freak saw the con section from my black and white review, and dreamed up the strongest improvements they possibly could, and then implemented them into these games. And the craziest part is, that this is only one of three battle-heavy areas you'll find in Black and White 2. Along with the PWT and the Battle Subway, which is identical to its previous incarnation, there's also two brand new battle areas known as Black Tower and White Tree Hollow, which can be accessed in Black City or White Forest depending on which version you own. The end goal of these facilities is to make your way through 10 floors of trainers until you're strong enough to defeat Benga, Alder's legendary wielding grandson. Other than a guaranteed shiny post-completion and the ability to obtain some great items as you climb, these facilities aren't nearly as difficult or rewarding as the previous two competitive areas found in Unova, but they can make for a fun challenge at times. And of course, adding some extra content for battle-minded veterans certainly isn't a bad thing. Upon clearing the fifth floor, you can even obtain and share a special key with other players. What does the key do? Well, utilizing the new Unova Link feature, players can use the Tower and Tree Hollow keys to access its sister game's exclusive location. In fact, Game Freak was so proud of this feature that they actually created six keys in total that can have serious effects on the version you're playing. Along with the aforementioned Tower and Tree Hollow keys, there are also keys that unlock both an Easy and Challenge mode, as well as two final keys that allow you to battle and capture various Regis depending on which version you own. However, by far the best part of Game Freak going all in on Unova Link is the Memory Link feature, which allows players to sync their original black and white save files to their new campaigns in black and white too, resulting in hyper-specific continuity between the games. Now, fair warning, activating it can feel a bit clumsy at times, and I definitely needed a refresher before setting it up for my playthrough this time around. But once it's all synced, the games are able to natively access new events and flashbacks that help to marry the continuity from both games in a way that makes the concurrent storyline shine even more. Certain characters like Iris and N are given more context as to how they came to their current mindsets and positions over the past two years. Other characters like Bryson and the Striaton triplets are given time to explain what's important to them and why they abdicated their positions as gym leaders. In fact, it's during Silen, Chili, and Cress's memory that one of my biggest gripes about their place at the end of Black and White is resolved. As it turns out, they feel like they weren't strong enough individually to join the other gym leaders in thwarting Getsis and the Shadow Triad during the attack on the Pokemon League. They even talk about how they feel like a joke when compared to their peers. And it's because they blame themselves that they vow to start their training all over again to become as powerful apart as they are together. In one short scene, we're given an update on what these guys are up to now, a deeper understanding of their dreams and greatest fears, and of course a candid explanation that answered not only my questions from the previous installments, but also how and why Sharon became their successor. This is quality stuff right here, and it's why this generation as a whole feels so much richer story-wise than any other. And this is just one of many great flashbacks that provide this sort of development for a multitude of fleshed out characters. But Memory Link doesn't stop there. Any of your old diplomas or trophies from the previous games can be found in your old house back in Uvema. Some of the old Pokemon N battled Hilda and Hilbert with back in Black and White can be found and captured in the same areas where he used them. And you can even have exclusive post-game battles with Sharon and Bianca, where their teams are the exact same as the ones you faced two years ago, right down to the starter and monkey Pokemon they originally chose because of your in-game decisions. Connecting both games this deeply was a stroke of genius on Game Freak's part, and it succeeds here so well because of the way it takes two parts of a giant story and condenses them into one singular adventure in a way very few games before or after have done. Of course, the only disappointment is that you'd think with so much time put into this feature, it would eventually lead to a showdown with the very character you controlled in black and white. Could you imagine that? The former champion and savior of Unova, the guy everyone won't shut up about and is constantly comparing you to, standing at the end of your journey and waiting for a challenge. It could have been the red on Mount Silver fight for a brand new generation, except with the memory link at its disposal, it could have been hypothetically even more immersive. Imagine if by accessing your old save file, they wielded the very team you raised and defeated Getsis with all of those years ago. Now it's not just Red's famous Pikachu, or Sharon with the Semi-Sage that you have to worry about. No, now you have to defeat the same Samurott that started you on this adventure in the first place. Or the goofy Vanellix that you learned to love after it helped you topple Alder and got your team a place in the Hall of Fame. 
and the more time and effort you put into them back then would be reflected in the opposing team standing across from you now. And it's up to you and your new team to overcome your past self and prove that you're the one true champion of Unova after all. It's certainly not a deal breaker, and as it stands, Memory Link and the connectivity it enables is still one of my favorite elements of this generation, period. I just really think that had they included Hilda or Hilbert, or maybe even a Gen 4 protagonist using the backwards compatibility found in a 3DS, it would have made for a seriously iconic send-off for the 2D games as a whole. But to be fair, even without this final showdown, the postgame's still pretty great. I already mentioned a few things like the Pokemon World Tournament and some of the battles and faces found after the credits, but along with all this, there's still a few loose ends that need to be resolved from our initial campaign. For starters, there's still a giant people-eating glacier dragon somewhere out there. And now that it's been awakened and possibly tortured by a bunch of corrupt pirates, it sort of feels like someone should go deal with that. Oh, and speaking of dragons, in one of the coolest callbacks to Black and White, we can actually travel underneath the rubble where N is waiting in his castle to provide some closure and a battle for his dragon partner's heart. As I've said previously, N is perhaps my favorite character in all of Generation 5, and although I wish we'd gotten a bit more information on his whereabouts and practices during the two year time gap, I think his arc wraps up quite nicely. Once he's certain his father's reign of terror is finished for good, he resolves to become the conduit between the hearts of Pokemon and people. This is a guy who's been cast aside, manipulated and abused, and looking to repent for his past sins. And by the end of these games, you get the feeling that although he may not be healed in full, he's at least found enough inner peace to part with Reshram or Zekrom. I also think it's meaningful that he encourages us to unleash the powers of and befriend his signature dragon, as it's the same one that we fought against in the original titles. On their own, these are two games, two dragons and two heroes who save Unova at different points in time. And if you want, you can experience each of these stories on their own and feel a sense of pride when the end credits roll. But it's only by experiencing both journeys and interacting with the characters and Pokemon who enrich them that we're able to see the full saga unravel and achieve harmony. For every ideal, there is a truth. For every black, there is a white. And for every Hilbert, there is a Nate. And now each champion has their own mascot Pokemon to reflect their half of the story. But moving on, along with N's send-off, the postgame is used to give more closure to many of the other characters who got shafted over the course of this story. I already mentioned the memories that provide more context into characters from the original set of games like Iris and Lenora, but as we make our way through the remaining parts of Unova, we get a bit more information on these games' newcomers, and despite there only being a few of real importance, I think the additions here all work. The new gym leaders, though not the most memorable, are solid additions and definitely have distinct personalities that put them on even ground with the Skylas and Clays of the world. But for my money, the two most interesting newcomers have got to be our rival and the game's mysterious new villain, Colrus. Although it's revealed he's yet another figurehead for Getsis, Colrus might just be the most anime antagonist in the history of Pokemon. The power-obsessed motivations, the outfit, and my god that hair. But to me at least, it all makes him stand out in a way that most of the series' villains don't. Sure, there's others with goofy style, but Chorus is so eccentric that you sort of look past how unemotional he is. The guy just loves his research and wants to push Pokemon to their absolute limits. He's nowhere near as compelling as Getsis, or as sympathetic as N, and that's perfectly acceptable for these games. I wish at times he felt a little more threatening, but overall I think he works really well in his ultimate role, and I'm glad this wasn't the last we get to see of the Icy Genius. But out of every character we come across over our 40 plus hour campaign, the one who rises above and deserves the most praise has to be Hugh. For some strange reason, when I went into this playthrough, I remembered Hugh as being sort of a mix of Barry's impulsiveness and Sharon's snarkiness, but dialed up to 11. However, to my surprise, I couldn't have been more wrong, because in my opinion, this is the best pure rival we've gotten since Silver. N as a whole is probably still the best character among everyone in Gen 5, and don't get me wrong, I still have a huge soft spot for my boy Barry from Platinum. But as a character with goals and honest reactions, and in terms of actual arcs, he was among the best in the entire series. He can be ignorant to other characters at times, and the man certainly has a fiery temper, but when you realize it's all born out of the hurt he experienced as a child trying to protect his sister's Pokemon from getting stolen, it all sort of makes sense. He doesn't crave strength in the same way as Blue or Sharon before him, and he's not really a bully unless it's while standing up to bullies themselves, and I find his journey in this game fascinating. 
He's just a well-written character with a lot of emotional weight, and it's kind of a crime that he was relegated to a sequel game where lots of people likely missed out on his character's arc. I also think it's a nice twist that speaks to the greater themes of compromise when it's revealed that the purloin the Shadow Triad stole has evolved both figuratively and literally since the last time it was taken. And seeing Hugh fight to regain its trust and actually deal with the reality that this Pokémon might not know him after all he's done to save it is a much messier conclusion than I'm used to seeing in Pokémon. Now, it's normally at this part in a review that I go through the Pokémon designs that stuck out to me the most, but of course, with this being a direct sequel, there's nothing to really assess unless you count a few new forms here and there. So in lieu of that old tradition, I think now's a good time to do a sort of rapid-fire sequence on all the positive new additions to these games, that maybe don't deserve a big spotlight like the Memory Link or Hue, but certainly need to be mentioned. Starting off, these games fix two of my biggest gripes from Black and White's campaign by adding a little more choice and a lot less monotony as you proceed through the region. We're still not in red and blue territory, but there's a few small instances like being able to grab Professor Juniper before or after you face off against Skyla, or optional battles with the Swords of Justice that help remedy the issues I had with Black and White's unyielding linearity. Again, it's not much or anything, and overall the game still suffers in part due to this A to B formula, but it feels like there's a little more choice this time around. However, where they improved exponentially is in the amount of triple and rotation battles the game offers while we're still making our way through the main storyline. Too much grinding is one of the biggest turnoffs you can have in an RPG, and over the years Pokémon has had its fair share of broken level scaling or redundant trainer battles, but I'm happy to report that Black and White 2 are mostly free of these issues. By simply adding all of the new Pokémon and switching up the rules once in a while, it keeps these titles from feeling like work. There's lots of double, triple, and even rotation battles that give me the sense that Game Freak really wanted to include lots of experimentation and celebrate the controversial new battle types that were introduced in this generation. Other new additions that I found to be satisfying were the impressive amount of legendary and special Pokémon that can be found in this game, hidden grottos which can result in items or hidden ability Pokémon, and finally, the brand new metal system. The only reason I'm not going to spend an absurd amount of time on metals is because they've yet to bring this mechanic back, so clearly Game Freak is content to let things be. But essentially, there's this guy named Mr. Metal who hangs out at Pokémon centers distributing medals that award certain feats and achievements. And let me tell you, there are medals for everything. There are medals for walking, medals for saving, medals for fishing, and medals for trading. I understand that sounded like a Dr. Seuss poem, but I assure you that all of those are real tasks that the game wants you to complete to some degree. I'm not complaining by the way, it's actually a nice feeling when you go to heal up at a Pokemon Center and Mr. Metal surprises you with some random award for a task you didn't even think would be recorded. I just wish the developers simplified the system a bit and maybe made some of the requirements less random, but hey, gold medal for effort. Moving towards more familiar territory, I think the soundtrack is just as varied and important this time around as it was in the previous games. It borrows and remixes many of the best themes from Black and White, while introducing equally stellar tracks like Route 19, Humalau City, and the melancholy Frozen City, which sounds like a track ripped straight out of something like Chrono Trigger. Actually, when compiled together, I believe that this generation's music rivals any JRPG I've ever played when it comes to its emotional and ambitious score. And finally, before I move into the weaker aspects of Neo Unova, I'd like to give a special shout out to the side quests in Black and White 2, with specific praise going to the strange house at the base of Reversal Mountain. I spoke about this chilling side quest in a Halloween countdown video a few years back, but honestly, every time I play through it, I'm reminded of just how powerful it is. For those of you who are unaware, what starts as a mission to get a lunar wing eventually turns into a tale of desperation involving a young girl who became trapped by a Darkrai's long nightmare and is left to a horrifying fate. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to what exactly happened, as we're given minimal information on how everything went down. Did her parents abandon her? Was Darkrai's intent malicious? Was she still alive two years ago on Marvelous Bridge when she popped up during a Blink and You Miss It cameo? And if so, should we feel guilty for never reaching Lentimus Town and saving her during the events of the last games? The truth is, no one really knows for sure, but what I do recognize is the effort that Game Freak imbued into such a small side quest. I mean seriously, how many times in the series before and after The Strange House have we been able to go on side quests where the goal is to catch a legendary Pokémon? And yet, very little of them have anything more than a quick blurb of text that adds any real substance to their encounter. Because at the end of the day, this entire sequence is a fancy way of being able to catch a Cresselia. 
And yet, because they spent the time to craft a narrative around this Pokemon, involving some random ghost girl from a previous title, it's become something so much more, and only helped to strengthen the attachment we as players have to everything and everyone involved in this game. I absolutely love it when Pokemon tucks these sort of darker elements into their games. It all started back in 1996 with Mewtwo's tragic origin story. And I'm impressed that after multiple generations of games, Black and White 2 continued the tradition, and Game Freak continued to make our hearts skip a beat. Oh, also the game finally asks you instinctively if you want to use another Repel when your current one runs out. This of course has nothing to do with Ghost Girls, but like that particular side quest, sometimes it's the smallest things that feel the most monumental. But now, it's that time where I get so heated, I could unthaw Opelucid City, as we make like Marlin and dive into the ocean of problems I had with these games. I want to start this section off by letting you guys know that I'm not going to take the criticisms I spoke about in the black and white review and rehash them here. This isn't me trying to make excuses on behalf of Game Freak, as it is sort of a developer's job to fix and address issues from previous entries when creating a sequel. But rather, I'm taking this approach because with this being a direct sequel that reutilizes Black and White's engine, assets, and region, it's naturally going to suffer from a lot of the same issues. And it's only reasonable to assume that if you weren't a fan of things like musicals or the new Pokemon themselves back then, then you might still be better off with a different generation here. Having your game grind to a halt city after city so you can catch up on a very complicated plot that needs to both forward the narrative and provide context for what's happened over the two year time gap certainly isn't ideal. But I can forgive it because it's baked into the game's DNA, and messing with the formula in a sequel that derives so heavily from its previous incarnation would have not only been problematic, but also sort of unfair to what came before. Plus, they actually did either tweak or enhance a lot of the weaker elements of Black and White, such as creating the Pokemon World Tournament as a stronger alternative to the Battle Subway. However, one specific area that I personally believe the game could have been better in is in its Pokemon availability as you progress through the main campaign. Now, I know what you're thinking, but Stan, didn't you say there's more Pokemon than ever this time around? Isn't it great that there's so many familiar faces that can be added to your team fairly early on? And to that I say yes, and of course. As I've already explained, expanding the available roster of Pokemon and giving the player more options from multiple regions is the perfect move for these games to make. It results in refreshing battles as you make your way across a mostly familiar locale, it invites older fans of the franchise back into the fray, and it's yet another positive representation of compromise and balance displayed in these games. So in that regard, my only issue with the inclusion of older Pokemon is that in order to make room, certain Gen 5 creatures got pushed back to the postgame. What do I mean by this? Well, despite there being a sizable amount of well-balanced and interesting Unova-centric Pokemon throughout the main storyline, for whatever reason, a good chunk of the best ones are only available to you after you've already registered your team in the Hall of Fame. For example, I really wanted to use a brand new water type for this playthrough, as I'd picked Tepig this time around and thought it'd be a good idea to have one because I remembered how important Surf is during the late game. Of course, I could have evolved an Eevee into Vaporeon, or caught a Mantine, two fun potential options from older gens. But this time around, I really wanted to utilize something from Gen 5 specifically, and most importantly, a Pokemon I've never had on my team before. So I looked up a few options and landed on Caracosta, but was surprised to learn that in order to get Tortuga via the Plume Fossil, I'd have to visit Necreen City. Which of course, in this game, is only made available to you after you've gotten through the main story and become the champion. It's worth mentioning that you are absolutely able to trade over any Pokemon from the original games if you need something specific, and that's exactly what I did in order to get my Ancient Turtle Monster. But I think it's just a little disappointing that there's a handful of great Pokemon who are in the same boat and could have benefited from more exposure earlier on in these games. However, I want it known that this is by far my smallest gripe, and obviously one that is especially noticeable to me as a trainer who likes to strictly use native Pokemon to the generation I'm playing, and most folks won't even notice the issue. But while talking about Pokemon exclusive to Unova, I do think now's the perfect time to discuss a much more obvious misstep found within this generation, and that's the quantity and quality of alternate forms. Personally, I think most of them are interesting additions. However, I will agree that the worst offenders in all of this have got to be the Forces of Nature trio and all of the effort it took in order to make them interesting in the slightest. 
In the first games, they were basically one copy and pasted design that seemed awfully similar to the far more iconic weather trio from Gen 3 in terms of both their origin and abilities. But then in Black and White 2, we finally got to see their unique Therian forms, which gave them new abilities, cries, and of course identities that were finally their own. However, the only problem was that back then, the only way to obtain these new forms was to install a 3DS AR game called Pokemon Dream Radar. This made getting the exclusive trio a pain in the butt, as you had to spend enough time to encounter each one separately, and then transfer it using the Unova Link into your game. It also especially sucked at the time for those who still hadn't purchased a 3DS, as you needed that system in order to download the app, despite the games being on the previous generation of hardware. And I think it's just another reason why many fans today look back at all of Gen 5's alternate form legendaries, especially the aforementioned commies, with a sense of underwhelming disappointment. But the good news is when it comes to disappointments in these games, that's kind of it. Sure, I could complain about Pokestar Studios, or about how Zinzolin is paraded around as the main antagonist for far too long, or even take umbrage with how in some stretches the games can feel slightly derivative. I also sort of wish they switched up the Elite Four in a similar fashion to Gold and Silver, and maybe had Lenora pop up, having taken over for Caitlyn or something. But these all feel like I'm being nitpicky, and what these sequels ended up being is infinitely better than what many assumed we were getting based on how much time the developers actually had to get these games completed. And I think that's why it's so hard for me to find cons this time around. Because for all intensive purposes, Game Freak only added and expanded the amount of features found in Black and White 2. The story and characters are deeper, the locales and battling is richer, and the games overall feel more hopeful and optimistic as a whole. A common sentiment I see from the Pokemon community with each new gen is that for every step forward, the series takes two steps back. So for example, in the original Black and White, we got new features like triple battles and a more JRPG-like storyline. But this was at the cost of other features like Pokemon walking behind the player and older Pokemon entirely. But here, it's all just more. It's all just stronger, and it feels like I'm eating a delicious sundae buried under the weight of dozens of cherries, and it makes for an entirely satisfying experience. If anything, it's just sort of a shame that by the time these games arrived here in the West, it was only months before the pendulum swung once again towards a new generation, and with it the hype, because these games sort of deserved better. The team behind these sequels clearly put far more love and care into the final products than they objectively needed to in order to make sure these titles sold, and I'm thankful that they showed so much respect towards one of my favorite generations. But of course, Gen 6 did come along, and it was met with levels of hype and expectation that the franchise hadn't seen since its earliest days. But for a very brief time, Pokemon Black and White 2 were some of the most anticipated and rewarding games from a traditionally safe series, and as you'll soon see in my verdict, I think they've since gone down as two of the very best. For over a year now, many people have asked me how I was going to review Pokemon Black and White 2. Would I give them the same treatment as I do the remakes? After all, it's almost all of the exact same characters, there's no new Pokemon unless you're counting alternate forms, and the gameplay is copy and pasted for better or worse. But I knew from the very first badge I earned that despite how challenging it may be, and as bloated as this video might get, I had to give them the exact same in-depth treatment as the originals. And that's because these games take all of the best fundamentals found in Black and White, and remix them in an exciting way that make Black and White 2 stand apart on their own. They deserve their own in-depth review because, unlike any other remake, sequel, or reimagining in the series before or since, they possess their own identity, even if it's a borrowed one. The closest direct comparison I can make with these games is to Super Mario Galaxy 2, but even something as well-crafted as that excellent sequel didn't have as much new and transformative content as Black and White 2. Sure, they have a lot of the same flaws found in the original, and sure, they can become derivative and get a bit stale in certain areas of the campaign, but the world-building and depth of character found throughout all of Generation 5 as a whole is unmatched by anything else Game Freak has ever made. These are powerful games that use the bonds between people and Pokemon to inspire the player to go out and pursue their own truths and ideals, whatever they may be. For many people, these games were a swan song of sorts for the Nintendo DS era, and for being the ultimate way to close out one of the best libraries in gaming history, I'm going to award Pokemon Black and White 2 an A. However, just this once, I'm going to break my rules and go one step further and award Generation 5 as a whole with an A+. 
Neither game is truly complete on their own, but together they form one remarkable experience that'll leave you satisfied with your adventure and make you feel more empowered than any other game in the series. I recognize that everybody's criteria for what makes a good Pokemon game is vastly different from my own, and I respect the community enough to never claim that these two games objectively represent the apex of the series. But as I've said plenty of times before, Black and White and their sequels are extremely special to me for a variety of reasons. But most importantly, they got me back into the series, and because of that, inadvertently led me to YouTube and to so many unbelievable moments with all of you. For that reason, I'm forever grateful to both of these games for getting me here, and to you guys for watching. But feelings aside, it's because of their ambition, ability to transcend the series formula, and for being excellent RPGs that I recommend each and every one of you try them out for yourselves if you haven't done so already. Just if you do, try and play the actual sequel to your specific version for the best possible experience. Unlike me, who caught Zekrom twice. Well, it definitely took way longer than it was supposed to, but I'm happy to say that I got both games in the Gen 5 saga covered, and if you're looking forward to the Gen 6 review, just know that as much as I'd love to say it's coming this summer 2020, I've gotten in trouble before for promising a release date, so I'm not going to do it this time. I will work on it, however, but for now I'm just I'm happy if you guys enjoyed this review. Uh, I put a lot of time and effort into it, and I am really, really sorry for the delay and the wait. There was a purple hair across, but I promise now I'm back on track. I even just booked off some time from work to really hunker down and get some Gen 8 content out for you guys. There's going to be countdowns, uh, top 10 streams, like it's going to be a really good time, and I hope we make some more good memories together. But uh, yeah, that's going to do it again. It was so much fun. I mean, I know it took a really long time, but these are sort of the apex of the series, right? Between these and the Gen 4 games, I think more and more fans are coming to the conclusion that that was the golden era. And so I really, really needed to do everything I could to make these reviews as great as I could make them. Um, but yeah, thank you so much once again. Um, I really, really do hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, as I always say, happy hunting baby rhinos. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns about where I've been, what I'm about to make, or my current plans, just, you know, drop a comment in the comment section below and I'll try my best to get back to it in a uh, somewhat fast manner. But uh, thanks again, see you soon. As always, I wanna give a shout out to my sponsors, who at this point, I don't even know why they put up with me. You guys are amazing and I really hope you like this one. If you enjoyed this video or any others, please hit that subscribe button and ring the bell as I genuinely put over a hundred hours of work into this project across so many months and it would mean a lot. And once again, I'm really sorry that I haven't uploaded in forever and I understand if you'd rather spend your time and energy on another consistent creator. There's some seriously amazing Nintendo YouTubers who've popped up in my absence and I recognize there's no shortage of choice on this site. Anyways, that's all for now. Take care. I'll hopefully see you guys during some streams and... Happy hunting.